want to tell you that I am thoroughly overjoyed to be with you on this Sabbath morning and to be with you for this week coming up. I believe that God desires to do something very special in our lives. And I don't believe that that's just for when we organize events like these or when we organize occasions or special sessions. I believe that God, day by day, is saying to us as we come to Him each and every morning, to consecrate ourselves to God, he says, look, I'm going to do something that even if it were told to you, you would not believe it. And I believe that is going to be our experience this week. And that has nothing to do with Sebastian Braxton. It has everything to do with our willingness to respond to God and what God is saying through his word. And so where it begins is prayer. And so I'm going to ask you as your guest speaker for this week, as you guys are hosting me, and you guys have been great hosts, by the way, and you guys have been very friendly, and you guys have been very warm, and I trust it'll get warmer, uh, besides the fact that it is summertime. But we're going to get acquainted with each other personally, but I want to challenge you to pray for yourself. And not only for yourself, but for everyone that attends any sessions that you attend this week. And your prayer is this. God, I want you to speak to me. And I want you to give me the courage to do what you're calling me to do. The prayer is, Lord, I want you to speak to me personally. And I want you to give me the courage to do what you are calling me to do. Are you willing to pray that prayer with me this week? Can I see your hands? You say, Sebastian, I'm willing to pray that prayer with you this week. Praise God. That is my prayer this week. When I travel to preach, I am sometimes a little bit, um, sometimes I get a little bit confused because I feel like I leave more blessed than the people I came to share the word of God with. I feel like I get more revived than that, than they, even though people say that they had a great time or God was speaking to them, but I feel like for myself as a preacher, I want to be transformed. I don't want to just give information, amen? We're not the news. If we want to know information, we have Google, amen? But Google can't give you a Bible study. Google cannot exalt the cross of Christ. Google cannot resonate with you and say, I understand what you're going through. Google can't do that. They're trying to do it, right, with these artificial intelligence and robots and all these different things. Social robots that try to respond. But no matter how we try to mimic real life in technology, there is no replacement for the human being that was designed by the greatest architect known in the universe. The very hands of Jesus. There is no technology that can match what God has designed in you and in me. Especially if we are surrendered to his spirit. There are amazing things God can do, but I don't want to jump ahead of myself. I have a week. So let's just take it one message at a time. Amen? Amen. All right, would you pray with me as we begin? Father in heaven, we have not come to hear the words of a man. We've come to hear the words of God. Our desire, Lord, is that you would speak through him and you would speak to him. That Jesus would be lifted up. That all men and women and children would be drawn to him. And that they would not resist the drawing power of the good news of Jesus Christ. Father, you have raised up this church in Melbourne to do a work. And it is our prayer that we would get to it. But Lord, now as we sit at your feet, teach us, Lord, and may the sweet, sweet spirit of Jesus be upon every mind and upon every soul, impressing upon us the truth that will sanctify us and prepare to meet our God who is coming soon. This is our prayer, and we trust that you will help this to be our experience, for we ask in Jesus' name, amen. I want you to take your Bibles and go to the book of Isaiah, chapter 46. I want you to know that I myself was a student in a secular university 
when Jesus found me. And one of the things that really grabbed, grabbed me was the issue of prophecy. And prophecy is something that is unique to Christianity. And it is a wonder that we do not talk about it enough. And as much as we should. And I'm going to share with you why we should talk about it. Isaiah chapter 46. Are you there? All right. The Bible says, beginning in verse 9. Remember, I still hear pages turning, so I'm going to give you another second. If you're there, you can say amen. Okay, if you're not there, just say have mercy. We will wait. Isaiah 46, beginning in verse 9. Remember the former things of old, for I am who? God. I am who? God. He says, I am God, and there's how many others? No others. So if he is God and there are no others, this is where we can attach the word. We can put the magnet on the divine fridge that says God is unique. Can you say that word with me? Unique. unique. That means he's one of a kind. There is no other like him. Do you know that things in the world that there's only one of are very expensive? Isn't that true? I don't know if you've ever been to the Louvre in Paris. And you know what famous painting they have there? The Mona Lisa, right? And it's like surrounded by people from China, from Italy, from all over the world. And they're just like plaguing this picture. There's a rope around it. It's encased in a like bulletproof case, which is also a case inside. And all you see is people like 10 feet away from this little small picture, take, just, just click and you just see flash the whole time. So even your picture has flash, it has other people's, you know, trying to get in your picture. It's just, it's a terrible situation. And I was so upset that I had walked so long in this museum to go see this, and I was disappointed. But the reality is they're like, there's only one. This is Leonardo da Vinci. This is like one of a kind. This thing is unique, and we call it priceless. But can you imagine that the God that you worship, there is no one else like him. Your wife, your husband, your kids, your boss, your best friend, your favorite preacher, your mentor, there is no other like him. And God says that he is unique. And when you have uniqueness, you have value. In fact, you almost have the fact you can't even put a value on it. Why? Because it cannot be replaced. There is no amount of money that can get you a new God. Amen. There is no amount of intellect, there is no amount of ingenuity, no amount of engineering that can get you a new God. He is irreplaceable. And when you and I come to that reality in our experience to say, listen, the God that I worship is irreplaceable. How can I skip this time in studying his word? How can I miss this time of communion? Because if I lose God, do you know what you have lost? If you lose him, something that is one of a kind. He says, I am God and there is no other. He goes on and says, I am God, there is none like me. So not only is he unique, there is nothing you can compare to him. There's no one like me. We like to say like, oh, that person is like Jesus or you're the only picture of Jesus that people will ever see. And I understand what we're trying to say, that God works through us, right, to do these kind acts. Or as Jesus put it in, in Matthew 5, 16, let your light so shine before men that they may see your what? Your good works and glorify you. Glorify who? Your father in heaven. But that's interesting. Aren't they your good works? Isn't it your light? Your light, your good works, but God gets the glory? The only conclusion you can make is it didn't come from within you. It came from outside of you. But in this vein, we are not like him. <laughs> and there is no one like God. There is no one kinder than God or as kind as God. There is no one as generous as God. There's no one in this room who would be willing to give their only son 
for someone that hated them. There's no one in this room. It wouldn't even enter your mind. When you think about someone that you hate, someone that indulges in the things that just irk you to your very core, <clears throat> you're not thinking about what you could give for them. You're thinking about what you're going to protect yourself from them. I don't want this person around my house. I don't want you to have my phone number. I'm going to unfriend you from Facebook. I'm going to block you on Twitter. I'm going to block you on Snapchat. Every possible means. I will go to the court and get a restraining order so that you cannot come within certain feet of my house. You're not thinking about what you can give. You're thinking about what you can take away from them and why they cannot have access to you. But God looked at us while we were yet sinners, while we were those who were against God, while we had enmity with God. He was thinking about what can I give to restore the relationship. And he bypassed the lowest angel, even if he gave the lowest angel, that would have been valuable. Even if he would have given Gabriel the highest angel, that would have been valuable, who dwells in his very presence. Even if he would have given whole galaxies for us, that would have been valuable, a billion, billion stars. But he bypasses all of these things and chooses the most valuable thing in the universe, and so I'm going to give this for someone who's worked for my harm every day to restore that relationship. And he says, I am God, and there is none like me. Amen. There is none like him. But now he gives us another attribute. He says in verse 10, declaring the end from the what? From the beginning. And from ancient times, things that are not yet what? Done. So when does he declare these things, according to verse 10? I want you just to pretend like you're not from Melbourne, okay? It's okay to respond to the preacher. <laughs> just pretend. I'm not from Melbourne, okay? I'm from Melbourne. You're from America, okay? <laughs> and it's okay to respond to the preacher. So the Bible says in verse 10, he declares the end, but when does he declare it? From the beginning. So in order for him to declare the end from the beginning, right, he's there in the beginning, number one. Number two, he knows the end. And number three, we actually can live to find out if he told the truth. Are you following me? If someone tells you as it's happening, you're kind of like, nah, this is too close. You could have arranged this. But if I tell you from the very first day you stepped into university, you're going to meet this guy. This guy's going to invite you to a church called Gateway. You're going to come to that church. God is going to speak to you at that church service, and you're going to start going. And you're going to join a care group on Friday nights. And you're going to go do this. And I started telling you all these things that you're experiencing. As you go through university, you would be thinking to yourself, where is that guy that told me the end from the beginning? And you know why you want to know him? Because you're thinking, I have some specific questions <laughs> that I want to know. And God says, the thing that makes me unique, one of the things that makes me unique from every other religion, every other God, he says, is the fact that I am God. There is none like me. Why? Because I'm declaring the end from the beginning. He goes on to say, from ancient times, the things that are not yet done saying, my counsel shall stand, and I will do all of my pleasure. That is a hallelujah statement, if you know God. Because you know the things that please God. And God says, when it comes to my pleasure, I'm going to do all of it. All of it, every drop. I'm going to fulfill all my pleasure. So when we talk about Bible prophecy... And we're talking about prophetic things. We're talking about an area of Bible knowledge that makes God unique. This is one of the things when I was a secular university student that attracted me to Christianity. The thing that attracted me to Christianity was the fact that I could evaluate it without joining the religion. They could say my very first Bible study was on a Bible prophecy. And as this person sat down with me and said, Sebastian, look at this prophecy and look at the history. And I'm thinking to myself, I know the history. 
I just didn't know there was a prophecy. Now that I'm looking at the prophecy, I can't deny the history. I can't deny that God said this and it happened. So now I have to make a decision as an atheist. As an unbelieving secular university student, I had to sit in my room and make a decision in my mind. If you are going to accept this, you can't just look at this as any other book on the shelf. This is not a psychology book. This is not a bio neuroscientific research study. This book is inspired. There is something unique about the Bible. That it contains information before it even happened. But the question is, what is God's intention in declaring the end from the beginning? What is God's intention in declaring from ancient times the things that are not yet done? And Jesus answers that question. Let's go to the book of John chapter 13. John chapter 13. John 13, we're going to go to verse 19. And we're going to notice that Jesus three times talks about why he tells us things in advance. Because I'm very interested to know what Jesus says. Because whatever Jesus says, you know you can take that to the bank. You can trust it. It is more sure than the ground in which you stand on. Amen. John chapter 13, are you there? Can you say amen? The Bible says in verse 19, Jesus says, listen. Now I tell you before it comes, that when it does come to pass, you may believe what? That I am what? That I am he. I am he is code language for that you may believe that I am the son of God. That I am God who has come down. That I am the Jehovah of the Old Testament. I am the Lord that created Adam. I am the Lord that spoke to Moses in that burning bush. I am the Lord that led Israel out of Egypt across the Red Sea. And he says, the reason why I give prophecy, the purpose of prophecy and why we study prophecy is to increase our faith in Jesus. Can you say amen? That's why he tells us ahead of time. Prophecy is not about beasts. Prophecy is not about, hey, do you think this thing is the mark of the beast? Prophecy is not about, hey, isn't Jay-Z putting up some diamond symbol and some conspiracy theory? That is not what prophecy is about. The goal is not for you to be afraid to buy a certain type of car with a certain type of symbol. The purpose is not for you to sit online searching obscure websites on the dark web so that you can figure, oh man, I think our prime minister here in Australia is a mason, 33rd degree. <laughs> or you're looking at the way that Vikram is shaking people's hands. I think our pastor might be, look at his handshake. <laughs> That's not why God gives us prophecy. He gives us prophecy to say, the reason I'm telling you this is not so you'll focus on the crisis, is that you'll focus upon Christ. It doesn't matter about the crisis when you have God. When you know Jesus is the Son of God, you recognize that the Bible says the name of the Lord is a strong tower. It's not even just a tower. It's a strong tower, and the righteous run to it and are safe. Amen. You can run to Christ in any crisis. And you will be safe. But too many times, the lesson of prophecy is not just for us as Christians in our spiritual journey back home to heaven. It is a lesson about every single day of life. That when I find myself in a crisis, I shouldn't be focusing on the crisis. I should be focusing upon Christ. Jesus told you that through much tribulation, we must enter into the kingdom of God. He told us that in the book of Acts. He told us that in the world, you will have tribulation. Didn't Jesus tell us that? He told us before it comes to pass so that when it happens, you should flip out and start becoming afraid. That you should get mad at God that he allowed some suffering to come into your life. No, he says, I warned you about this so that when you see it, you will realize I can trust Jesus's words. And Jesus doesn't just say tribulation will come. He says, but rejoice. Because I have overcome the world. So if you see the tribulation, as sure as there are problems in your life, you can be just as sure that there is deliverance. Can you say amen? amen? Listen, we're not talking about fables here. We're talking about true prophetic reality. And when these things come to pass, we don't need to be afraid. We don't need to sorrow. We don't need to be troubled. We need to run into the name of the Lord. 
because that's a strong tower. And we will be safe if we put our trust and our faith in Jesus and we focus upon the Christ and not the crisis. Now, the Bible says, again, in John chapter 14, go to verse 29. Jesus begins to talk about the Holy Spirit and he repeats it again to his disciples. Because whenever you find Jesus repeating things, he really wants his disciples to know this. The Lord's Prayer is repeated twice in the Gospel of Luke. Twice, which tells you Jesus really wants his disciples to know this. John chapter 14 and verse 29. Are you there? Can you say amen? The Bible says in verse 29, And now I have told you before it comes, that when it does come to pass, you may what? You may believe. Listen, it's not only that prophecy is to lead to belief in Christ, but prophecy should strengthen your faith in general. We must recognize that God tells us things ahead of time because he wants to strengthen our faith. He wants to strengthen our faith, specifically in Jesus, but to strengthen our faith. You know, sometimes we forget that if prophecy is designed to strengthen our faith and we are not studying a lot of prophecy, we can end up with very weak faith. Amen. Too many times we, we stray away from prophecy because we forget that the purpose and the aim and the goal and the focus is not the crisis, but the fact that this is what God told us would happen. And as we're watching these things fulfilled before our eyes, our faith increases. People say, how do I grow my faith? You know what I tell them? Study prophecy. And your faith will go up. There was a story of a man, I don't know if you guys have ever heard of the book, A Thousand Shall Fall. Have you heard of this book? If you have not read that book, I'm challenging you to read it this week before I leave. I'm not even joking. A Thousand Shall Fall. When I was in college, and I was a young Christian, and I was finishing my undergraduate degree in finance, I remember I wasn't reading a lot, and I went to this graduation ceremony, and the speaker said, leaders are readers. And he says, if you graduate today and you stop reading tomorrow, you'll be an illiterate the next day. And I was thinking, man, why is this guy going on and on about reading? And then I realized, you know, God was speaking to me. Sebastian, you need to read. <laughs> so I went home to my dorm and I was like, man, all right, Lord, I prayed and I was convicted. I need to start reading. And God gave us a mind and that is a talent that we must improve for God. So I said, all right, Lord, I'm going to start reading. And I made a commitment. I'm going to read one book every month. That was my commitment to God. While I'm in school, we're not talking about reading for school. We're talking about reading for my own personal development as a Christian. So the first book was, I remembered a good friend of mine. His name was Albert, Albert Kim. And he said, Sebastian, you have to read this book. And he was so passionate that I need to read the book. He ordered it for me on Amazon and mailed it to my house. So I figured, well, since Albert is so excited about this book, I, met, I better make this my first book. You know how long it took me to read the book? Two days. This is in between classes. I mean, I was like an addict. Went to class, grabbed the book, came back to my dorm. I'm like, 20 minutes, let me just. <laughs> Two days I finished the book. And one of the stories is in the book is about a guy who was in the German army in the time of World War II. He was in Hitler's army as a seven-day Adventist. And he said they gave him a gun. He said, nope. He threw away his gun. And he made a wooden one to keep around so people wouldn't think he threw away his gun. So he just made a fake one to carry around so people were like, okay, he didn't get rid of his gun. We can trust him. So one day he was talking to his fellow soldiers and he said to them, he said, guys, you know, Hitler cannot win the war. And they were like, what are you talking about? We're winning the war. We're, we're, there's nobody that's defeating us. And he says, no, the Bible says that it can't happen, right? And they said, now, mind you, if you're talking against Hitler in the time of World War II in Germany, <laughs> you're probably going to be killed. So he said, guys, listen, is, I'm, I have no problem showing you, but is this on the record or off the record? So they said, OK, it's off the record. So they, when, in the military, when it's off the record, you take off your hat. We call it your cover, but you take it off, and that means this is off the record. This is not official business. So everyone took off their hats, 
and he gave them a Bible study on Daniel chapter 2. <laughs> and after he gave them this Bible study on Bible prophecy, and he says, listen, when, when Rome is divided, right, the iron and the feet and the toes and it's iron and clay, and he says, you can't get it to cleave together, and that's exactly what Hitler's trying to do. And the Bible says it cannot happen, he will fail. This is while the war is going on and Hitler is winning. So everyone put their hats back on, they were silent. And then he laid down in his bed and he was thinking, I don't know what I just did. <laughs> so he prayed. The next day he gets approached by two men he'd never seen before in his life. They said, the supervisor wants to meet with you. He said, okay, so he comes in. They go to see the supervisor. The two men are sitting next to him and he says, uh, Hazel, that was his last name, Hazel. He said, I heard you have some information about the war. <laughs> he said, well, yes, sir. He says, uh, I heard you are coming from the Bible. Yes, sir. He says, can you give me that same uh, information? He said, is this on the record or off the record? <laughs> so they took their hats off. He sat down, he gave them the Bible study, he said, that's why the Führer, right, the German word for leader, that's why the Führer cannot win the war. They just looked at him and they said, Hazel, you're dismissed. So he left and he was thinking, I don't know what. And he said, Hazel, by the way, these two men you've never seen before are professors in history. I wanted to confirm that what you're saying historically is accurate. So they left. Hazel never heard from them again. He was still alive, praise God. When the war ended, the only unit in the war that had food and reserves was his unit because his supervisor, because of that Bible study, believed that Hitler was going to lose. So he started storing food and clothing and resources away from when the war was over. Because God had told him beforehand and when it came to pass, he believed. This is the power of prophecy. To strengthen your faith, and it's in that book. You need to read that book. So if not, don't order it today. It's the Sabbath. But tomorrow, <laughs> order the book, A Thousand Shall Fall. You need that book. All right, I'm, getting, I'm straying too far from my notes, <laughs> and I'm running out of time. I want you to go to our scripture reading, Matthew chapter 24. So now we know that prophecy is what makes God unique, number one. Number two, we also know that the purpose of prophecy is not to focus upon the crisis, but to focus upon what? Christ, amen. So the focus is not the crisis, the focus is Christ. That's what we should focus on. And the result of prophecy is not to make us afraid, is not to scare us into heaven. It is to draw us closer to Jesus and increase our faith in him. That is the purpose of prophecy. Anyone who teaches you prophecy and does not focus it on building up your faith in Christ is not teaching you properly. It's not teaching you properly. Now, let me go forward. In our scripture reading, the Bible says, then Jesus went out, Matthew 24, verse 1. Are you there? Amen. Or I see maybe it's on the screen. It says, Then Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came up to show him the buildings of the temple. So what did the disciples want to show Jesus? What did they want to show him? The buildings of the temple. Where is this temple located? In Jerusalem. Now, I want you to understand, right, these people are very pl proud of the building in Jerusalem. They pull Jesus aside and they say, Jesus, as we're going up the Mount of Olives, have you ever seen the sun set upon the white marble of Jerusalem? It's a beautiful sight. We should just sit right here and, and we can just show you this is the sheep gate and this is this gate and look how beautiful this is. And Christ looked at them and he says in verse 2, guys, this is amazing architecture. The buildings look beautiful. Is that what Jesus said? No, he looked at them in verse 2 and he says, Do you not see all these things? <laughs> all the buildings that you showed me, all the beauty there? He says, Assuredly, I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. 
In other words, your beloved building is going to be destroyed. The disciples looked at him in verse 3 and they asked him three questions. How many questions? Three questions. Notice in verse 3, now as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us when will these things be and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the world? Now, I want you to process with me for a second with the disciples. Whenever someone asks you a question, every question comes with a bag, right, a bag of assumptions. So anytime someone asks you a question, or anytime anyone asks me a question, I'm automatically processing in my mind, what are they assuming? So someone comes and they say, so Sebastian, um, is this your first time to Australia? I'm going to get that question a lot this week, I know. (laughs) But in that question, there are certain things that people are assuming. They're assuming, they say, well, he's definitely not from Australia. That's an assumption, right? If you say, is this your first time to Australia, you're automatically assuming he looks like a person who is not from Australia. So my immediate question is, what is it about me that makes you think I'm not from Australia? Well, they say, first of all, you're the one with the accent. (laughs) We all sound the same. Maybe it's my height, maybe it's the way I dress, my clothing, whatever it is, automatically you can assume things. So when the disciples come to Jesus and say, okay, Jesus, when will Jerusalem be destroyed? They could have stopped there, but they asked two other questions. They said, what will be the sign of your coming and what will be the sign of the end of the age? So immediately, what are the disciples assuming? They are assuming that if Jerusalem is going to be destroyed, it must be because Jesus is coming back And therefore, it must be the end of the world. Are you with me? So now, immediately in this mindset, right, why is it that they're associating the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem with the end of the world and with the second coming of Jesus? Why would you assume that the only reason this temple would be destroyed is because the world is over? That's it. (laughs) They saw the destruction of Jerusalem as the sign of the end of the world. But yet they're asking him, what will be the sign of the end of the, way, end of the age? And what will be the sign of your coming? And when will these things be? They're also assuming that Jerusalem is that sign. But yet they're asking, what is the sign at the same time? This is very interesting dialogue. Now, there's one other thing I have to bring out here. And that is, we must understand the significance of the temple in Jerusalem. If I told you there was a physical place in Melbourne where the glory of God was physically revealed, God was in that building, and you could go to that building, you could kneel down and you could pray 15 feet away from God, would you go to that building? Anyone here? Let me see your hands. You say, I would go to that building. You knew the presence of God was in that building. Now, you see, all your hands went up. Now, obviously, if you're a Jew and you believe that God dwells in that building, there is the Shekinah glory in the most holy place. And you're telling me that the the place where we go to meet with God, the place where we bring our offerings, our praise, our prayers, our needs, when Hezekiah was overtaken by Sennacherib, he took the physical letter that he had received. And the Bible says he spread it out before the Lord. That means he took it into the sanctuary. And he said, Lord, do you see this letter? That makes me comforted to know that when I get that email that says, Sebastian, your mother is dying of cancer. She has 24 hours and you're in Australia. I could print out that email and go to that place and took that letter in the presence of God. Lord, I know you see this email. You see, as people, we are very tangible We're very physical, we like touch, we like things that we can handle, things that we can see. Maybe the light gets brighter while I'm praying. And I could almost be certain that if I'm praying 15 feet, I know that God hears me. And can you imagine that someone told you that building is going to be destroyed? Who could destroy God's house? Who would be that powerful? (laughs) The only way you could destroy God's house is if God allowed it. (laughs) There's no one greater than him. 
So in the disciples' mind, the only reason this is happening is because the world is over. <laughs> That's the only reason. So in these three questions, the whole book of Matthew chapter 24 is structured around these three questions. Are you ready? Those of you who are taking notes. So in verses 4 to verse 14, Jesus is answering the question, what will be the sign of the end of the world? He answers that question first. From verses 15 to verse 22, Jesus is answering the question, when will Jerusalem be destroyed? I'm going to walk you through this very quickly because I only have a few more minutes. And from verse 23 to verse 44, Jesus is answering the question, what will be the sign of your coming? Are you guys, you got that in your notes? That way you can go back and check me out tonight, this afternoon. And say, is he telling the truth? But let me walk you through this briefly. Whenever you're studying the Bible, one of the critical things to look for in Bible study is this device we call repetition. What is it called? Repetition. When you want to know what the Bible is emphasizing, you look for the words or the phrases that are being repeated over and over and over again. So when we look in Matthew 24, verses 4 to 14, we're going to notice three times. How many times? Three times Jesus is going to refer to the end. Are you with me? Now, let's look at that briefly. Matthew chapter 24, we began in verse 4, and Jesus answered. So we know he's answering the question. And he said to them, take heed that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name saying, I am Christ, and will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not what? Troubled. See that you are not what? See that you are not troubled. Who said that? Jesus said that. When you watch the news, and I used to be addicted to the news. I said, wake up, breathe, and turn on the CNN. <laughs> that used to be my day before I met God. I love watching the news. I want to know what's going on. I'm checking this out. I'm checking this out. Now you got CNN on your phone. I'm so, God, I'm so glad that God delivered me from, because if I had it on my phone, it would be over. Updates, bling, bling, bling. Your phone's going crazy. Wait, what's going on in Pakistan? Another earthquake? And most of the news is always bad news. Isn't that true? It's not even really news. What it should be called? Central Network for Bad News. That's what it should be called, not Central News Network. If you want to know the bad things happening in the world, please tune in. We want to tell you how bad the world is getting. Please look. It's not really news. It's just bad news. So now, when I'm, when I'm watching this thing, one of the things that you realize is you can look at all these things happening and you start becoming troubled in your mind. You start thinking, what's happening to the world? Little kids are committing crimes that only adults used to commit. How is it that two 12-year-old girls conspired to kill their best friend in order to fulfill a game on YouTube? Because they're watching some horror movie-based game, and through this game, they're like, oh yeah, if you do this, then he might appear to you in real life. So they put 15 knives in their backpack, walked their friend out into the woods, and stabbed her multiple times, and left her for dead. Thank God someone was riding their bike and came by and now the girl is alive. Praise God. That was good news. The bad news is those were two 12-year-old girls. And I'm trying to figure out how did you get out of your house at 12 years old with 15 knives and your mom didn't know? It's the truth. There was no way I was walking out of my house with 15 knives and my mom wouldn't know. <laughs> it's not possible. We didn't even have cell phones and texting back then. You just felt your mom calling you. <laughs> you knew you should go home <laughs> right now. <laughs> While I'm trying to kill this girl, my mom's going to kill me when I get back. <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. So you're looking at this terrible tragedy and you could start getting troubled in your mind. When you find out that all these people in business are lying to you. Corruption. What companies can you trust? Even food. Now they're, you know, investigating Chipotle through their claims that their food is non-genetically modified, but some people are saying they're lying to you. 
Then all their tomatoes had E. coli, so they had to shut them all down in California. And you're thinking, who can you trust? You can't even go out to eat anymore. And you could easily be troubled, but Jesus says, when you see these things, you should not be troubled. He says, not only you should not, he says, see, make sure that you are not troubled. Why? The Bible says, for all these things, what? Must come to pass, but the, but the what? The end. Is that what your Bible says? So there the end appears one time. Jump down to verse 13. But he who endures to the what? The end shall be what? Saved. Is that repetition? But he's not done yet. Go to verse 14. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations and then what? The end shall come. So the first thing he tells us is, when you see signs of wars and rumors of wars, that's not the sign of the end. In fact, that is the beginning of sorrows, the Bible says. Then he goes on to say, but the person who's going to be saved is the person who endures unto the end. Do you know some people are going to be lost because they just gave up too soon? Some people are going to be lost because they just did not hang on to Jesus. Long enough. It doesn't matter how tightly you're holding on to Jesus now. What matters is, are you still holding on to Jesus then? We used to sing a song when I was running stride in Boston, doing campus ministry at Harvard and MIT. And one of the songs we used to sing was this African song that says, hold on to Jesus. And it was like a round where you keep singing this thing back and forth. I will hold on to Jesus. And we would always claim the promise in 2 Chronicles 15, where the prophet came to them and he says, the Lord is with you as long as you are with him. I love that promise. The Lord is with you as long as you are with him. So what that reminds me every single time, Sebastian, are you with him? Because if you're with him, then what? He's with you. Are you following what I'm saying? All right, we got to wrap this up. You're starting to look tired, like you're jet lagged. <laughs> and I flew across the world. <laughs> so Matthew 24, we see that the sign of the end is that the gospel is preached in all the world as a witness, and then the end shall come. If that's clear, let's say amen. 4 to 14 is about the end. Verse 15 Jesus says, therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, then let those who are where? Verse 16. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Where is Jerusalem? Where is Jerusalem? In Judea. So now we know he's saying you got to go back to the prophet Daniel. When you see this abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, Stand in the holy place, that's the sign. Jerusalem's about to get destroyed, it's time to go. So Christ is such a masterful teacher, he uses the misunderstanding of the disciples to teach them the truth. <laughs> he uses the destruction of Jerusalem as an example, as a type of the destruction of the end of the world. So he says, here's the end. Now I'm going to talk to you about Jerusalem. Now I'm going to talk to you about the sign of my coming. Now let's go. Keep going in Matthew chapter 24. He says in verse 23, Then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or there, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the very elect. See, I have told you what? Beforehand. There he is again. Therefore, if they say to you, look, he's in the desert, don't go out. Or look, he's in the inner rooms, do not believe it. For as the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so also will the coming of the Son of Man, what? Be. Now watch what he says here, verse 29. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then the sign 
of the Son of Man will appear in heaven. That's interesting. So the sign of his coming is going to appear where? Where is it going to appear? In the heavens, in the sky. He says, then the sign of the coming of the Son of Man is going to appear in heaven. Notice what he goes on to say. He says, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and with great glory. And he talks about a fig tree example, and then he talks on no man knows the day or the hour. So essentially, we're going to see some cloud in the sky is the sign of his coming. It's going to be in the heavens, and you're going to see it in the sky, and it's going to be as the lightning comes from the east and shines in the west. Everybody's going to see it. This sign, this cloud that is coming in the sky will be the sign of his coming. That's when you know. Now, here's the interesting thing. Jesus was answering how many questions? How many questions? Three questions. Has he answered all of them? Yes or no? Yes, he did. But where are we? What verse are we at? He stops talking about the second coming in verse 44. Therefore, you also be ready for the Son of Man is what? Coming at an hour where you do not. But he keeps talking. I want you to know this is very unusual of Jesus. Jesus is not a person that talks too much. Jesus doesn't waste words. Jesus doesn't give you information just to give you information. Here the disciples are asking Jesus three questions, and he has answered their questions, but he continues talking unto the end of chapter 25. It's all read in your Bible, if you have a red letter Bible. In other words, Jesus spends more time talking about something beyond their question than he spends on answering their question. And what he spends from this point on is he tells them four parables. And in these parables, Jesus is saying to the disciples that, listen, the danger of a disciple is not that he won't know the sign of Jesus is coming. The danger for a disciple of Christ is not that he won't know the sign of the end of the world. I just told you what it is. When the gospel is preached in all the world, then the end will come. But your danger is not that you don't know the signs. The danger is that you won't be ready. So I'm giving you four parables to teach you about what it means to be ready for the end of the world, to be ready for the sign of Jesus' coming. Who doesn't want to know how to be ready? <laughs> Amen? Who doesn't want to know that? I'm already over my time. So I have to wrap this up, and so I have to keep it brief. Jesus looks at his disciples, and he says, when the end comes, there's going to be two kinds of disciples. Either you're going to be a wise and faithful servant, or you're going to be a foolish and evil servant. Jesus says either you're going to be a wise virgin, or you're going to be a foolish virgin. Either you're going to be a wicked and lazy servant, or you're going to be a faithful servant by improving your talents. Either you're going to be a sheep on the right hand, or you're going to be a goat on the left. There is no in-between as a disciple. In each of these parables that Jesus gives, and I'll expand upon them this afternoon in the trainings, Jesus says in each of these parables that people are going to be lost because they neglected to do something that Christ had left them to do. The first one neglected to give meat in due season. The second one neglected oil. The third one neglected to use his talents and improve them for the Lord. The fourth one neglected the sick, the poor, the lame, the ones in prison. And because they neglected these things, they were lost. Why? Because they didn't know that their master was returning? 
No, they knew. It's because they weren't ready. It's because they weren't ready. Today, as we begin this weekend, as we begin this week, you recognize, and I must recognize, that prophecy is designed to increase our faith in Christ. And the reason why it's designed to increase our faith in Christ is because it's not about telling us when this is going to happen and when that's going to happen and when this is going to happen and when you see this on the news, then we know this and know that. No, 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 no. That's not why. It's going to increase your faith because it should cause you to recognize that there's something you're neglecting. When you think about being ready, you realize I'm neglecting something. Because if I asked us right now, right here, this morning, today, and I said, how confident are you that if the Lord came today, there would be no accusations against your name? That we neglected something. How confident are we that as followers of Jesus, that we love his appearing and we want to be ready. Because there's nothing that will break Jesus' heart more than to know that he went to go prepare a place for you only to come back and he can't take you. There is a place for you and me in heaven. Do you understand what that means? There is a place for you. Not like a place like, oh, you got an apartment. We're talking about a place in the economy of the universe. In the divine kingdom, he says, this is you. I have this prepared for you, Sebastian. I have this prepared for you, Vikram. For Henry, for whoever. He says, I have it prepared. This is your place. He looks at that throne. He looks at that service. He looks at that part of the universe and he says, this one is for you. I have a place for you. But the problem is, we could end up not being ready. And just as God is unique, so are you. He only has one you. And you only have one him. I tell people all the time that with my three kids, you could easily think to yourself, that if one of my kids died, heaven forbid, you would say, well, Sebastian, you still got two other kids. Is that comforting? I know all the parents are like, oh, he's talking crazy. <laughs> the fact that I have two other kids does not replace that one. And the reason is, is because the love that I have with that child is different from the other two. The reason is, is because my son reflects me in a different way than my daughter's. Because my firstborn is like me in this way in which my youngest is not. So when God looks down on us, he says, listen, if you are not ready, do you recognize that there's some aspect of God that he sees in you that no one else in the universe shows? You can't comfort Jesus when it's over. And we are lost. We can't do that. What are you going to tell him? Oh, it's okay, Lord. Look at the billions that are saved. That's like telling a mother, look at the other two kids you have. But you don't understand. That was my only Sebastian. He was unique. And God says the same thing about you. Bow your heads with me. As we bring this meeting to a close, Heavenly Father, we are praying this afternoon that maybe we may be aware of the signs of the end of the world. We may be aware of the signs of your coming. 
We may be aware of the signs of the when this world is going to be destroyed. But Lord, you are right. Our danger is not that we won't know. It's not information that we are lacking. It is preparation. And so as we begin this week, we want every single meeting to help us to be ready for the coming of the Son of Man. We want every single meeting to increase our faith through prophecy in Christ and not focus our eyes upon the crises of the world and the crises of our own lives. But this afternoon in this meeting, Lord, maybe we already know that we are neglecting something. Maybe we already know that as disciples we are not ready because there's something we're dealing with in our private lives that we are hiding from the rest of the church that we are hiding from our families, that we are hiding from someone else, that we know we are not ready. We will not be ready. And we're trying to hurry up and get this issue settled in our lives, but the reality is we need to stop fighting this in our own strength and we need to turn it over to Jesus this morning. Trust that he is the author and the finisher. Trusting that he that has begun a good work will also complete it. So if there's anyone in this room right now under the sound of my voice that says, Lord, there is something I'm dealing with. There is something that I have been neglecting that I know will prevent me from being ready to meet Jesus who has a place for me. And this morning, I'm not coming to commit to putting more effort. I'm not coming to commit to fighting more in my strength. I'm coming to commit it unto God. I'm coming to take my eyes off of my struggles and put it on my Savior. If that is your desire, I want to invite you to stand right in your seat and say, Lord, I'm bringing it to Jesus. There's something I'm neglecting that I'm fighting over, that I'm struggling with, that I know can prevent me from being ready to meet Jesus. But this morning, I'm bringing it to Christ. I want you to stand right where you are. That's your desire. God is speaking to you in just that way. I've been neglecting something, but this afternoon, I'm bringing it to Jesus. I've been struggling with something, but this afternoon, I'm bringing it to Jesus. I've been fighting with something, but this afternoon, I'm bringing it to Christ. Anyone else? I'm not going to hold this much longer. This is between you and God. Every head is bowed, every eye is closed. If you're not going to stand, if God is not speaking to you, pray that those who need to stand, stand. To find grace, to help in this time of need. Because Jesus wants you to be ready. That's what it communicates. He wants us to be ready. He wants us to meet him in peace. He wants us to win. He wants us to come off victorious by his grace. Anyone else, before we pray, wants to stand and say, I'm bringing this to Jesus. My struggles, my neglect, whatever it is that you feel may help you, prevent you from being ready, bring it to God. Father in heaven, you see these who have stood. You see these who have decided to bring those things that they sense may prevent them from being ready for your coming. It is our prayer that the divine hand would reach out into their lives just now. That God's hands would rest upon them as they rested upon Ezekiel. That you would give them visions of God in their captivity and show them that you can revive them again. And Father, that this neglect, that this struggle, that this issue is nothing compared to the power and the strength and the wisdom that they're going to find in Jesus. Lord, that you and them can overcome this thing and that human effort combined with divine power will lead to success and will lead to victory in Jesus' name. Father, we pray that you would bless them according to their faith 
according to their surrender to you and according to your mighty grace and power. Give them a testimony, Lord. Make them trophies of what Jesus can do in the life of a willing heart. This is our prayer. And we trust that you will help this to be our experience. For we offer this prayer from our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.